on the debate tonight. Five sets of data indicating that our economy is slowing down. The latest job reports done by the Azim Premji University has reported that 50 lakh people lost their jobs in the two years after the monetization. The report also goes on to say that the higher educated people are the most unemployed, most of them between the ages 20 and 24. In fact, this comes at a time when jobs or unemployment is one of the main issues in the Lok Sabha elections. And it's not just the employment crisis. Industrial production has slowed down. Scooter sales have contracted for the first time in 13 years. And with household savings taking a hit, consumption has also slowed down. Mirror now asks, is the Indian economy slowing down? Will the job crisis finally be acknowledged? Let's debate. All right, so here's the list of the indicators of the economy. The Azim Primji University has put out a report stating that 5 million Indians have lost their jobs since demonetization, both educated and those working in blue-colour jobs. The sales of two-wheelers, scooters and bikes specifically, which are an indicator of the health of the rural economy, have shrunk for the first time in 13 years. Passenger vehicles in India, sales have marked a decline of 2.9% from last year. Industrial production growth, or the IIP number, is at a 20-month low, at 0.1%. Capital goods segment, which is an indicator of investments in our country, saw output turning negative at 8.8% contraction. A CLSA report this month that interviewed consumer companies on the 9th quoted management of major consumer companies, Darbar, HUL, Godrej, Consumer, Parley, saying that demand of domestic consumption is actually slacking and both rural and urban markets they're actually seeing a drop. In fact, Godrej Appliances business head Kamal Nandi actually said that consumers are spending less on discretionary items and only buying necessary items at this point. But the number that really worries me is the household savings number. Now, this is an indicator of how much the average Indian home is managing to save the household savings as a factor of our GDP was at 17.2, the lowest since 1997. Is our economy in serious trouble? And what does that mean for us as Indians? Joining me on the show, Zafar Islam for the BJP. Jayati Ghosh is a professor of economics at JNU. Vivek Kaul, senior journalist, and Santosh Merotra, also a professor and a senior journalist. We also have CM Vasudev, former finance secretary of the government of India. I welcome all of you to this conversation. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, I will start with you. It's always pleasant to have uh, a woman speak on matters of economics. So thank you for joining us. Good evening to you. Do you believe that these indicators indicate that the economy Good is evening. slowing down? Or are we perhaps misreading the tea leaves at this point? No, I think it's been evident for some time that the economy has not just been slowing down, but that it's been in deep distress. And this has been known to anyone who has cared to look carefully at the available data. Unfortunately, not much has been available. But the CMI data, which this report has used, has been showing for some time that ever since demonetization, we've actually had a dramatic fall in employment, in livelihoods, real wages have been affected, the informal economy has been almost destroyed. And after that blow, just when things were beginning to recover slightly, you had the whammy of the GST being imposed on an economy that was simply not ready for it. This was widely discussed, many journalists have actually looked at it. It's not surprising that these numbers are coming out and the government's attempts to suppress its own labor force survey even though it has unfortunately deprived all of us of accurate data, is still not able to prevent this fact from being widely known. Absolutely. Vivek, um, again, I, and I want to ask you the same question. Yeah, yeah. These are all various indicators. Does it all add up? Are there other indicators that point in a different direction? Should we be reading into this? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, we should definitely be reading into this. And, you know, uh, you know, in your know, introduction, you sort of uh, talked about yearly data. Mm. Uh, if you look at monthly data, which is like a little more recent, uh, you know, in, in March, uh, scooter sales fell by 25%, motorcycle sales fell by 14%, tractor sales fell by 15%, uh, 
uh, car sales fell by around 7% and commercial vehicles sales fell by around 4.7%. Now, in the last five years, this is only the second time when the sales of all these five, uh, you know, different type of vehicles have fallen. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first time was in February 2019. So, uh, you know, two months of consecutive fall in sales has not happened in the last five years. And each one of them is, a, you know, indicates consumption demand in a different way. Like, so explain to us, when you say scooters and you say tractors, right. what is this indicative so of? So scooter uh, is a very good, uh, you know, urban sort of demand. You know, more women tend to buy scooters than men. Uh, cars are the same, you know, reflects very good uh, urban demand. When it comes to motorcycles, it reflects both rural as well as urban demand. Tractor sales are a very good, uh, you know, indication of how the rural rich are sort of feeling yes. at a given point of time. And uh, commercial vehicle sales tell you how the investment as well as the infrastructure sector in the country is thinking. So this basically, these five indicators in a way cover, uh, you know, a large section of our economy. And they have fallen for two months in a row. Yes. And that's not happened in the last five years. So indeed, I mean, I think if this is not worrying, I don't know what is. So. In fact, uh, uh, Professor Merothar, I want to ask you about household savings. And this is important because this is a number that's released by RBI. Effectively, it tells us whether Indians are making more money than they need. So they're managing to save some amount of that in fixed deposits, in recurring deposits. But if household savings has actually fallen, and it hasn't fallen this much, hasn't been this low since 1997, what does that mean? What this means is that uh, real wages have been growing really very, very slowly. Despite the low inflation rate, the real wages have been growing very slowly. And if real wages are not growing because jobs are not growing fast enough, then inevitably savings are going to be suppressed and savings are going to be impacted. That's all it is showing. Savings. And, and is this worrying as a country or is this something that you, you know, one could feel a bit Of course it is from? worrying. Why is it worrying? It goes without saying. It, it, it's worrying because savings determine investment rates. Uh, savings are all, all also showing what is happening to consumption. I think we were hearing from Vivek also about what is happening to consumption. And I'm saying that, you know, neither rural wages nor urban wages seem to be uh, on an upward trend. And that's not surprising in, uh, because, because uh, jobs have not been growing. So going, going back to your question, why is this worrying? It would imply that invest, investment rates will tend to f go trend downwards further. They've already been trending downwards. So, so that's, that's the implication. That means growth will tend to trend downwards in the absence of investment growth. Well, uh, the question for Mr. C.M. Vasudev. Mr. Vasudev, do you agree with the economists and uh, with Vivek, who's a journalist here, that there is reason to worry? Yeah, I think, uh, I won't say reason to worry in that sense, but certainly there are a lot of headwinds uh, that the economy is facing for various reasons, I would say. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, this issue of savings that you are talking about, the yes. household savings and all, of course the savings in the economy also take into account the taxes which government collects, that is also part of the savings. So the relationship between savings and growth and job creation is very well known. It's in, in basic economics that you have to have savings, then you have to invest those savings, and that investment will lead to growth, and that growth will lead to jobs. So the worrying thing, I think, in the economy today is that the overall savings rate has come down. I believe it is now close to 27, 28 percent which used to be 35 percent, 36 percent as well, okay. one point of, okay. no, the that is the household savings. savings. Okay, you're okay. Overall, savings the household savings. Yes, yes. I, overall savings. Yes, yes. I'm talking about the overall savings. Yes, Overall savings in the right. economy. Right. That is, I think, around 27, 20, 27, 28 percent. And the investment rate obviously has also come down. Maybe if you add the uh, 
foreign investment and the foreign savings that are flowing into the economy, maybe investment rate, maybe even 30-31% uh, or so. So we were at a one point of time in the economy a few years ago when the savings were 35 36 percent and the investment was almost 40 percent which is take took into account the foreign savings and the foreign direct investment also so the worrisome thing is that more and more of our savings whatever saving number one savings are coming down and number two more and more of the savings are going into consumption type of uh, activities and producing less and less investment. So if you're not going to invest more of your savings, then your growth will slow down. And if the growth will slow down, then the job creation will slow down. So I think uh, this is a dilemma which the, uh, which the system is facing, the policy makers must be facing, that how to sort of uh, uh, balance the two with so much of <laughs> politics driving economics these days, oh. that there is so much of pressure by the political system on the policy making to spend more and more money for consumption. So you will be having less and less money left for investment and which means that you will be having a slower growth rate. So that is certainly a, a big, uh, big issue facing our economy today. But other than that, there are headwinds, but there are certain good, brighter spots also. Number one, the bank credit is sort of grown a little faster than the deposit rate, which is a good reversal of trend. Mm -hmm. So the bank credit is growing, your exports are growing, and uh, imports also. And the other thing about scooters and motorbikes, this monthly data, of course, there's, I don't know, one, I am not too familiar with the data on that point, but there is always a seasonality. If there is a slowdown in March, in February, uh, is it incremental with respect to the previous month? Hmm. Or is it uh, that slowdown is rest, uh, with reference to the same month in the previous year? Same month so in the previous year. So whether there is seasonality, same, so taking yes. the seasonality into account. Yes, uh, well, same month in the previous year, year on year. But yes. uh, there is always a seasonality. It's, if the comparison of on a year-to-year -year basis, these, these numbers that were, I, I, I can't vouch for those numbers. If those numbers are correct, I have no reason why they shouldn't be correct if somebody is quoting them. So, yeah. Then yes. they are certainly a cause for worry. So, yes. So the, the yeah. numbers are actually this this month of March compared March, to March last right, year, right. February compared to February last, last year. year, and this is Siam, which is the then, Association yeah, of is, Automobile Manufacturers. That is, that is uh, certainly, for the car that is, manufacturers. That is certainly worries. It's certainly worrisome. All right. Before I before I bring you in, and I, I know you have... Certainly worrisome, then. Yes. Certainly worrisome. So, uh, Zafar Islam joins us with the BJP. Mr. Islam, there's a consensus, and I just want to point out, I have two economists who are professors, one very senior journalist, and a very, very senior uh, a former bureaucrat from the finance ministry, all of whom agree that these are worrying indicators. Uh, do you agree that this is worrying? Do you agree that the government needs to, at this point, be very careful about what's going on with our economy? Well, <clears throat> see, the economy is in absolutely good condition. <laughs> there is absolutely nothing to worry. All these numbers which you are talking about, you have to see, do a back testing and see that last five years, the economy was doing, is doing very well, the consumption was there, the, the demand, whether it's it, electricity demand, whether it's a, a two-wheeler demand, whether it's a tractor demand, whether it's a commercial vehicle demand, everything was going up. But when, it yet, when it, you get closer to the election, Everything, everyone postponed their decision and always wait for the for the election to get over and then they, they take a call where what where to invest. Capital formation is there, infra is missing earlier, private investment is happening now, the credit offtake is there, the bank the bank was in very bad shape uh, with so much uh, NPS that has been capitalized. Hmm? That uh, uh, banks have started lending again. So there's a lot of momentum. Excess capacity was there in the system. That has been now that that excess capacity is over. So private investment is taking place. <coughs> Capital <coughs> formation <coughs> is there, yeah. but and GDP growth is there. But whatever, what whenever you get an opportunity, you speak about the job losses. There is absolutely no job losses, and there is no mechanism to measure whether how many jobs you have, whether you have lost. In, in informal sector, whether you have gained job, uh, gained more number of jobs, but I can tell you with conviction that you when you talk about the wages, tell me in in informal sector, has an, has anyone's uh, salary gone down? Have anybody has Mr. to take Islam. cut in salary? 
the pro- survey is going up. No, Who's? survey is going up. The and, and informal sector, informal sector, the livelihood. If Describe you have to, this you have informal have sector where you were. Be, no, no. First of no all, way. informal sector by definition. No, will let me not just complain. Salaries. Don't interrupt me. Okay. Or I've written everything no, down. No, I'm saying. Okay. Let me tell. You. I said that's why I said. See the livelihood. See the livelihood. The livelihood in the country has gone up today. The, the same family was was earning five thousand five years ago. Today they may be earning more than that. So the concept of job in rural area it does not exist because they have job but it does not get captured anywhere. Eighty-seven percent of our economy is in, in, in formal sector. There is no payroll method or system where every single job on a real time basis can be captured. So jobs are being created. Livelihood, you have to see the livelihood in rural areas. It has gone up. That's why the demand for electricity, that's why more consumption, the less saving. But uh, uh, clo- I, I must admit that closer to election, people do postpone their decision, wait for the election, general election to get over. If coming round is only because of the general election. But economy is in sound position. If you see just FDI, okay, all right. the numbers you have to see whether FDI is there. In, in 14 years, 2001, 2000, 2000 to 2014, we could attract only half a, a quarter trillion. Okay. From 2000 to 2014 to two, another quarter, a quarter trillion, and that to a, 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 a greenfield project, not in a brownfield project. Likewise, if you see the export number, okay, Mr. Islam, I have time, to bring in uh, high, the export okay. number. One so second, every, one second. Highest the economy export is doing okay. well. The GDP okay. growth is there. Okay. It's just All the right. momentum only because of the election has a okay. little bit. All right. All right. Uh, Let me bring in rebuttals. All right. Let me bring in rebuttals. Let me bring in Vivek call first. Okay. Uh, livelihood so, uh, has increased. Few, few things. Uh, first of all, you know, the problem with the BJP spokespersons is that uh, they tend to use absolute numbers always. You know, so the export to GDP ratio uh, uh, in 2018-19 uh, was around 12.2% which is at the same level as it was probably uh, in 2005-06. Okay. Yes. If you remove oil out of that, mm. uh, then we the export to GDP ratio falls to 10.38%, mm. which was the same level as it was in 2000, which is at a lower level as it was in 2005-06. Okay. Okay. Then <clears throat> Mr. Islam talked about excess capacity. Yes. If you look at the Obicus survey, which the RBI carries out, the capacity uh, utilization is still less than 75%. Mm. And that has been the case for the last uh, four to five years. Okay. It has not changed. Uh, and capacity basically means the number of factories that we have and the amount the, we can manufacture, yes, we're actually we are, using less we are than we can. manufacturing can. around three-fourths of, of uh, what we what are. He said, of course, and this is this had, uh, like a rebuttal on, that during the elections, people put off their purchases and I, that's why uh, demand actually, has come down. Actually, you know, the theory is exactly the opposite. In, during the elections, because political parties spend a lot of money, exactly. yes. uh, the Formal economy tends to gain, and that money is again uh, spent and comes back into the system. So this is the theory that you know at least I have heard for the last 20 years. But uh, maybe the BJP has uh, you know given that they keep coming up with new economic theories. This is also let me uh, also you know, on that one, note so. point out that the cash seizures in this economy, the amount of cash circulating in the economy is the highest it has ever been because of this election. Um, Jayati Ghosh, go ahead, your rebuttal, please. Could I? Yeah. Yes, I, I want to come in on several points. One is about the elections. You know, historically in India, elections have been a boost to the economy. And precisely for the reason that was mentioned, it's not just this election. Over time, we have found that consumption increases dramatically during inventions. There's a kind of short-lived boom because demand rises, because political parties spend, and a lot of that is informal spending, and that generates demand for fast-moving consumer goods as well as for the motorcycles, the two-wheelers, and the other kinds of things that were mentioned earlier. So the idea that before elections people stop spending, that actually is completely wrong, and it's the opposite of what we have observed in the Indian economy over the last 50 years. But there is the other issue, and the the fundamental problem really is this absence of demand in the economy. And this is something that has been happening over a while because of the fact that we've had relatively jobless growth for quite a while, uh, in over the last 20 years maybe, and that a lot of the wage have have not been rising at the same rate as GDP. So wage shares of income have fallen, and workers normally consume more. And that's why, in fact, we've had less demand in the economy. To add to that, we've now had a major crisis in agriculture. So when everybody celebrates the control of inflation, we have to remember that this has come at the cost of agricultural incomes. Farmers' incomes have been almost flat. 
mm. and some of them have actually declined. And that's a huge source of economic distress and a huge source of declining demand. So we have to remember that differential rates of inflation matter hugely in this economy. The things that farmers buy, those have risen. The prices of those have risen. The things they sell, the prices of those have in fact fallen very recently or have remained flat. That's very important in terms of affecting demand. In addition, then, we have the informal economy. I've already talked about the loss of livelihood. Uh, the spokesperson of the BJP is completely wrong when he says we don't have data to capture it. Our statistical surveys have been specifically designed to capture informal employment. They were known across the world for this ability to capture different kinds of informal employment. And the latest labor force survey, which has not been released, but we have the leaked data, show us that in fact the informal employment that had been generated over this period of growth, even that has been very dramatically affected. And that's another source of declining demand. Now, all of this has negative multiplier effects. In other words, when you hit the informal economy, when you hit farmers, when yes. you hit small traders and small businessmen and tiny micro entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. their demand declines, they employ less people, those people come out, uh, lose wages or lose their jobs, they demand less, you get a spiraling negative effect that finally also hits the formal sector. And that is what is happening now. Right. We're getting uh, the formal so sector also being hit by this declining demand. Is especially, and uh, uh, Professor Mayrothana, I unfortunately don't want to take you down that route where you start to tell us again how jobs data is actually collated and why it has always for the last 40 years captured the informal sector as well. Uh, let's talk about the fact that there are surveys being put out from consumption companies like Godrej and HUL saying that demand is slacking and people are actually only buying what is necessary and not spending on anything discretionary at this point, which means that they're buying the toothpaste because they have to buy it, but they're not buying the AC because they can put it off for a few months and now is not a good time. What would that mean and what does that suggest to us in terms of our economy? Also, if there's anything you want to offer a rebuttal to uh, in terms of what Zafar Islam said, please go ahead. Right, so uh, let me make a few points. Uh, People are postponing consumption until after elections. If they were postponing consumption, then clearly it means people are saving more. So the savings rate should have gone up. But we know that the savings rate has, household savings rate has gone down. So how do, how do you square that circle? Point one. Point two, about formal sector wages have they gone down anywhere in any sector? I don't think any one, of his, any, any one of us said that. I was saying that real wages are not rising. Formal sector wages may rise a little bit, but if inflation is cancelling that out, then that doesn't mean that you know real wages have been increasing. If anything, the evidence is that because of slow job growth, wages have not been rising. On, there, there is another source of demand. I think uh, Joyti was rightly emphasizing the source of aggregate demand in the economy. There's not just domestic demand, there is the issue of export demand. And in the last five years, the dollar value of merchandise exports has actually been lower than it was in 2013 14. In other words, we have just not been able to export because we, we have damaged the, a significant part of the unorganized sector, which all, accounts for 45% of our exports. So why should we be surprised that exports are not, have not exceeded the 2013-14 level? Only in 2018-19, finally, we've just crossed this 2013-14 point. And finally, on power, we were told about power, that we are doing brilliantly on power. Well, plant load factor is still at the at, at sixty percent. Mm. Plant load factor is among the at the lowest level in a long time. And as Vivek rightly pointed out, capacity utilization is not exceeding seventy two percent. So, in other words, every indicator is suggesting that there is a compression of uh, aggregate demand. Well, we have questions, uh, interestingly, that's coming in from our audience, and this one is interesting. Leonard says, is this another India shining episode? Mr. Zafar Islam, is this another India shining episode where the government and the party that runs the government is convinced that everything is great, 
but there is no indicator that supports that at all. The, actually, the rest of the country is feeling a very different reality. I, I think uh, all, uh, all the panelists, they are, they are fully aware of the state of economy, what we had in 2013-14. And it is the same economy which was, uh, it was uh, uh, designated as one of, the, one of the five fragile economy globally. And all the macroeconomic parameters at that point in time was looking terrible. And mm. today, if you just see the, all the macroeconomic parameters today and compare to what we had in 2013, and you, everyone knows that the economic, uh, all the parameters looking uh, very good. Where you had a negative uh, real interest rate at that point in time. The inflation was in double digit. Now it has come off. Inflation is well under control. We, the, uh, we had uh, all the uh, fiscal prudence we have followed. The fiscal deficit from f uh, five, uh, five and a half to it has come down to a three handle. Hmm. Then you, you, all the other macroeconomic pa parameters, tax to GDP ratio is showing very, very, very good. Then you also, have, if you see the corporate corporate earnings, that has also gone up. So there are for very, very positive things. Yes, the the, the okay. consumption side, it's a consumption-led economy. Some uh, some uh, 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 in last few months, uh, if the demand has come off, it may have demand. But I'm when I was talking about the. Closer to closer to the election, there are, you uh, you see <coughs> commercial vehicle. There are many decisions which which uh, many of the investors do postpone purely because if they have want to put up a big plant, they will postpone their decision purely because they will no, see no, 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 the election. Mr. 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 All right, I have to bring decent. in people to. So, I, I, you know, we have to break this up because if you put in too many statistics, then I can't bring in uh, rebuttals. But we are not talking about people buying up commercial. Yeah. Fa commercial car plants. We are talking about the sales of scooters that has come down. But uh, Vivek Hall, here are the, uh, the things. He said, compare it to the economy yeah, of 2013-14. Yeah. Inflation is now very low, which is actually not a good thing. He said, corporate mm. earnings is high and that there is right. positivity. Your so, rebuttal. Uh, okay. So I recently sort of uh, you know wrote a piece for a newspaper where I compared uh, 15 economic indicators uh, in the Manmohan Singh era, uh, which is 2009 to 2014, the second term, and uh, Mr. Modi's term, 2014 to 2019. And in 11 out of those 15 indicators, uh, the Manmohan Singh era came out better, which is very surprising, but that's the way it is. And this included, uh, you know, things like domestic two-wheelers, car sales, tractor sales, uh, retail loan growth, uh, uh, you know, passenger revenues of Indian railways, commercial so on and so forth. On inflation, uh, BJP did better. Hmm. Uh, but that's also because food inflation has come down. If you look at non-food, non-fuel inflation, uh, that has varied between 4.5% to 5.5%. Yes. Uh, so for the middle class, it hasn't really uh, mattered much. The one indicator on which uh, <coughs> Mr. Modi has done really well is airline number of airline passengers. More people are now flying than ever before, and the growth airlines has also been first. Airlines are shutting down. Uh, airlines <laughs> are shutting down, but then, I mean, you can't blame the government for that. Yes. So, uh, so on a whole host of indicators, corporate earnings, in fact, in 2017-18, were at a, if you sort of look at them as a proportion of the GDP, they were at a 15-year low. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, you know, Manmohan Singh was bad. Uh, and, you know, in 2014, nobody really would have thought that Modi, Mr. Modi would be worse than that. But if you look at a whole host of indicators, I mean, that comes out to be the case. So, Well, that was a handy report then to have. Uh, let me also bring in Mr. Vasudev. Could I just add one thing? Okay. Ms. Go Professor Ghosh, go ahead. Go, go ahead, please. No, just one point. I just want to mention that, in fact, the second term of the UPA government was one of a very severe global headwinds. It, this is the period just after the global economic oh, crisis and then followed by very sharp increases in oil prices. So two factors that dramatically adversely affected the Indian economy. This government didn't have those adversities. This government actually benefited from very low global oil prices until quite recently. And it benefited, until, again, until quite recently from a much more dynamic global economy than but was the case in the second UPA. this government also faced in terms of banks' ability to lend. I mean, you'd completely discount the fact that uh, the huge NPS, yes. which has been the, <laughs> uh, the created purely because the way they had lent uh, from, from 2006 to 2013, 2012 or 13, that actually well, has most uh, of the yes. NPS uh, now. Uh, trans translated into the NPS yes, but, you know, and, and, and the bank's ability to lend it further. In any but economy, most of the NPS today occurred in the last four years. 
In fact, uh, Vivek, isn't that true? There was a report that said a large a number of the write-offs have happened recently. I feel terrible. I feel terrible, Mrs. Ghosh. I feel terrible when you speak like this language that it happened in the last four years. Are you economists or don't you understand where it was lent and how it was lent? Where did, 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 did they do Mr. Islam, any you should really calm down. Before? Let, let I'm me saying if you look no, at no, no, the no, NPAs, but, uh, more than half of the no, NPAs let me, let me discuss with date NPA. from the yes, last four years. Yes, I want to discuss years. with you NPA. You, your analysis is only showing a shade that yes, this, this has saying, happened in the last four years. I'm not saying, of course, there were NPAs that emerged no, no, no. in the previous No, period. let me just complete. Let me just question you. The... Let me question you. Let me question you, Mrs. Ghosh. Let me question you. Ask you a very straightforward question. When it was lent, since 1947 to 2006, only 18 lakh is the outstanding balance sheet size of the bank, uh, nationalized bank. In, in six months, in six years, from 18 lakh, it has gone to balloon to 54 lakh crore, the balance sheet size of the bank, nationalized bank. Whether it was lent, Judiciously, or it was just lent purely on, uh, on uh, to, uh, to project which cannot even generate the EBITDA. It, it service that debt. In fact, if you do an analysis as an economist, you will, si you will see no. that 60 percent of those projects Mrs. was Slum. not even able for, to first service. First of all, you should calm Forget down. About, this is a very uh, civil so conversation we are having. I have and actually written. Okay, 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 Mr. Islam. Okay, Mr. Islam, calm down. No. No, no, Kato, we've heard right you right. out. Mr. Islam, don't no, get no, upset. No, quick point. I have what, one second. One second. One it second. is true. But no, no, but you're right. shouting. Right. Don't shout. Right. There's no need. Give the people right picture. No, no, don't, don't shout. Allow, allow people to rebut give, what you I'm have not said. I'm, I'm you sound. It really sounds like you're shouting. I'm. Okay, calm down. Allow her to answer. I'm saying that I'm just humbly requesting that at least give the right perspective. Okay, let's humbly also listen to the answer. We can do well. We can do badly. Okay, but at least. As an, as okay, Mr. Mr. Islam, economy, you have to calm you, down you so that we can hear the answers. Right Are you willing country? to listen to the Not answers? Not only right or bad for the BJP. All right. The answer, Ms. Uh, Professor Ghosh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I just want to say I have written extensively on how there was too much of this uh, unfortunate lending that occurred in the second UPA, certainly. But what has happened since then is actually got worse. It hasn't got okay. better. That's the point. All right. I just want you to bring in Mr. 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 Vasudev earlier. Okay, no, 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 no. One second, one second. Let's, let's, we don't talk over each other. Okay, I'm, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. Let, I just want to bring in Mr. Vasudev. Mr. Islam. Mr. Islam, with all due respect, please listen to the other panelists. I want to bring in Mr. CM Vasudev. Mr. Vasudev, uh, you know, unfortunately, all of the conversations we have had about jobs, about the economy, about all of these other things in the last... A uh, year or so, actually, and we started actually covering this post demonetization. It's a general news channel, but I believe that the audience has a right to this information. We have members of the government, whether it was the Niti Aayog or spokespeople of the party, who come forward and simply deny there is any problem. Is that really the danger? Because for the longer we deny the problem, the longer it will take to actually find a solution. Now we've reached an election where basically denial is simply going to be the best route out. Is politics running the economy, Mr. Vasudev? No, that, there's no question. Politics is certainly running the economy. 99% it's uh, politics and hardly 1% is economics. But uh, denial, I suppose, is whether it is uh, for external consumption. I can't imagine that people within the government, policy makers, are oblivious to the, these type of headwinds which the economy is facing and the solutions which may be needed to solve these uh, the problems that the economy is facing. But uh, I think since we're discussing this uh, in a very political type of a uh, context, I think we need to recognize that uh, economics or growth process is no respecter of these artificial dates of when a new government came in and when the old government uh, uh, was there. Lot of the problems which this government faced probably in the beginning could be attributed to certain policy decisions or lack of policy decisions pre-2014. Similarly, many of the decisions which this government has taken could have medium-term impact. Some of them are 
tough decisions like the GST, uh, like the bankruptcy code, like the other improvements in the financial sector, investments in infrastructure, highways, investment in the power sector and things of that type, which are going to give you growth dividend over the next four or five years. So supposing a different government comes to power from 2019 and suddenly things look better in 2020, then will you say all that has been done in one year by the new government? No. It would be the effect that these decisions which this government have taken, the growth dividends will always come three, four, five years down the road. So similarly, I recall when the UPA 1 was there, lot of investment, national highway projects and HNHDP and other telecom sort of the investments that were generated, opening up of the telecom sector and all that, which was done during the previous NDA government, the benefit of that was reaped by the UPA 1 in the subsequent four or five years. So I think we should be very careful in attributing the, uh, the performance of the economy to these short-term political things. The economic growth process is no respecter of these uh, artificial dates. Fair enough. So that well, is sir. one general point I want to make. Prof the other point I, yes. uh, I, I, I'll come back. You know that I have to leave at 9.40. Okay. You know, I have to leave at 9.40. If I can just make a point before I leave. One second. I, I have to give Professor can Mehrotra I? an opportunity and then I'll come back to you, Mr. Islam. Professor Mehrotra, go ahead, please. Well, there is no question that this government inherited uh, a, a large stock of debt. However, we also know that in the first financial year that this government was in power, it continued to lend at a rate not dissimilar to that of the previous government, point one. Point two, why were uh, NPAs only at the, at the level of one and a half lakh crores and they went up to 11 to 12 lakh crores? That means act, the action to recognize the, the excessive lending and therefore to take action against it came too little and too late. And this is the main reason that we, are, we have a situation where NPAs rose to such high levels. And finally, no one was saying to the government that you undermine economic growth by carrying out demonetization, which obviously slowed the growth rate down, which multiplied the problems of companies, both informal as well as, well as formal. That means they, low, they were, had even greater difficulty in repaying. So, you know, the, the, we have to look on balance at what has been, of course, this government has attempted to achieve some, you know, the IBC and, and, and so on. But that resolution process is not going very far either. So you've got a situation where you've got write-offs of the, of, which account for 80% of all write-offs in the last 10 years have happened in the last five years. This, is a, this, is, this means that too little, too, too late was happening. And it's our, your and my taxpayer money which is going towards uh, okay. uh, recapitalizing the banks. Okay. I mean, All right. how so, long are we going to suffer this? Why are the banks not being reformed? The banks should have been reformed first before you began to recapitalize. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Zafar Islam wanted to speak. Mr. Islam, go ahead. Calmly, please. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, no, let, let me tell you. First, we have inherited this problem of NPA. Okay. And the, the way it has been lent uh, uh, recklessly since 2006 to 2012. And I, I think you should go and see how oh. the, the bank has lent. Six, uh, there is a report, and I'm, I request all the panelists must go there to the report with the Credit Suisse has, uh, 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 had come up with uh, in 2014. 60% mm. of the project where it was lent by between 2006 to 2014 was not in a position to service its debt. Forget about generating profit. And those, those projects was, were lent by UPA. I don't know what, uh, 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 on what pressure bank, what kind of pressure bank had to lend those projects. And I think because of those issues, if we had completely from day one had announced that the entire banking sector is in a, in a mess, you understand the economy was in one of the five fragile economies globally. You are not in a position when you inherited economy. I think uh, Mr. CM Vasudev, an experienced person, understand the dynamics. It's not because we could have announced the very first day a white paper and that economy is in a very bad shape. 
Everyone knows the economy was in terrible shape. All the indicators suggest as an economist, you know that. But slowly, slowly, we have taken a, a steps to put the economy back in order first. Of course, NPA problem we have recognized. We have recognized the problem. We tried to capitalize the bank, uh, 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 requested bank to first declare and get away with all the mechanism they were following where to hide these NPAs. We, we, have, we wanted to get rid of this problem one and for all, purely because they were hiding this problem and, and every bank chairman wanted to just hide this problem. How long you can uh, hide this problem? Uh, and it's a taxpayer's money at the end of the day. So we, we decided to uh, uh, slowly sh uh, 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 declare the NPA number and recapitalize the bank and put the bank in order. Uh, today, at least I can say that the lending, with wealth, even the credit offtake rate uh, 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 has come up, has come down significantly at that point in time. It's 5% compared to 27 or 28% we had seen. But at least the quality funding was happening. And today, the banks are in much better shape. And even the recovery more uh, because of IB, uh, uh, bankruptcy court, the legislation and all the uh, uh, structural reform which has been undertaken, this you also have a recovery of three lakh crores. Secondly, when you do when you undertake such kind of re structural reforms, it does slow the economy for some time. But as CM Vasudev have said, that over a period of five years or ten years, you will see the benefit reaping to the economy and to the country. So yes, we have we have taken some important steps. Which, which had also resulted in slowdown initially. But over a period of time, you'll see that Indian economy will do much better. And it, that's why it is not uh, 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 among the top six economy in the, in the world okay. and has the potential to, among the, um, to be among the top three economies globally. And sure. these uh, short term CMI report and all, I, I completely discard the CMI mm -hmm. report because if you see the sample survey, what they have taken, I think the CII report you must see and see the how the economy is doing well and what kind of sample they have taken. I completely discard the CMI report and the sample survey, what point. they have. Okay. Uh, I mean, I mean, you can't. CII is a lobby. I mean, if you if you discard the CMI report, you should be discarding the CII report as well. Uh, I think uh, you know one thing that I wanted to say was that uh, when I mean, obviously the uh, the Modi government in inherited the bad loans problem from uh, the previous government, but then they sat on it for almost two years, did not do anything. It was only when you know Mr. Raghuram Rajan sort of uh, ordered a review. And after that, the bad loans started to be recognized. In fact, even now, if you, if you, you know, look at the overall problem, there isn't much that the government has done other than pumping money into these banks, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't really, you know, throwing money at a problem is not solving the problem. Now, the fundamental question is, why does the government of India need to own 21 public sector banks? Okay. Yes. Now, this is, uh, you know, a debate that hasn't uh, happened at all. This and the whole, I mean, let's, let's just consider the Jerebe's mess has now happened mm. after all of the learning has now it's come gone in. Again. And we've taken, uh, you know, we've taken, the banks have taken on Jerebe's and then allowed it to fail. It grounded today. Yeah, so. I mean, so which is, uh, and, 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 and you know, the biggest I, point uh, is that. Fair, can uh, I just leave in, because no, I have another meeting, please? Yes, please go ahead, Mr. Islam. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, in, in November 2016, uh, you know, uh, demonetization which which happened i mean that put back the economy by at least two to three years so i mean yes they inherited the bad loans problem but they created an equally bigger equally big if not a bigger problem by demonetization so there is also some uh, you, you know a uh, uh, Professor Mayrotra, unfortunately, I mean, is, is one of the people who works on the CMI report uh, that Zafar Islam was uh, referring to. There has been a lot of problems as far as data is concerned, even with the monsoon prediction. We've had SkyMet say that the monsoon is not going to be, uh, you know, uh, at average or above average, but we've had the government's IMD come out and say, no, 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 monsoon's going to be great. What is the risk of a bad monsoon at this point on the economy? So are, you, are you asking me? Yes, I am. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, well, uh, whatever reports we uh, received from the Met Office suggests that the monsoon is going to be reasonably good. So, I mean, we have to wait to see. Uh, thankfully, the Met Office's uh, predictions have become better and met better o over the years. So, uh, I, I don't think that should be too much of a, of a, of a worry. But it is true that uh, there are firms which will be holding off any, any investment that they might, might be 
planning to undertake for a few months until a new government comes to power. That means nearly half the year of, the, of uh, might, might go before we might begin to see any, any revival. That's the, really the bigger source of worry. It's the fact that, you know, there will be, there is uncertainty uh, about, uh, uh, about politics. Yes, unfortunately, we, we're going to have to leave it there, but uh, there has been several, like we've talked about, several indicators that show us that there is something wrong um, on the ground. And India is really a, a country that functions on domestic consumption. We hope that Indians will do well, they will make a lot of money, they will save a lot of money and they will use that savings to buy things, thereby businesses will be able to add jobs and expand. That basic backbone now is starting to seem very weak. We're going to watch the numbers closely. Of course, there will be an improvement because of the kind of cash that's circulating in the market and this cash will be used by people to supplement their salaries and their income and spend it on their families for a while. But in the long term, whichever government is in the seat of power has to ensure that the economy comes first, that we find a solution for the jobs problem, that we find a solution. Uh, for the rural economy and for the crisis the farmers are going to because that is the only way to solve the issues we're facing. Well, let's go across quickly to a breaking story that is coming in at this point. Uh, we understand the Election Commission of India has put out an order and it has taken action this time against one of its own. The Election Commission has suspended the General Observer Mohammed Mohsin who allegedly tried to inspect Prime Minister Narendra Modi's chopper in Sambalpur um, while he was on campaign. Masin is a Karnataka Kada IAS officer. He has been suspended for dereliction of duty. The notice basically says that therefore, uh, taking into or taking everything into consideration, Commission places Mohammed Masin IAS under suspension with immediate effect until further orders. The headquarters of Mohammed Masin shall uh, be. Sabalpur uh, will wait for further orders. So this is the breaking that uh, breaking information that's coming in right now. This time, the election commission has sent a notice and an order about uh, one of its own observers, Aishman, on the phone line from Delhi. Aishman, what information can you give us right now about what really happened with that chopper? Well, election commission has suspended uh, the its general observer, Mohammad Mohsin, who is from the Karnataka cadre and he's an IAS officer. He allegedly tried to inspect the Prime Minister Narendra Modi's chopper, and this was said that he tried uh, to cause a concern to be a speechy, and that is why he has been placed on suspension, and the Election Commission has confirmed it. And they also said that this is confirmed by the written report from the District Election Officer and the DIG in the Sambalpur, and that is why he has been suspended, and he'll be there in Sambalpur until further orders say. Right. Um, is there any uh, any sort of response as to what he was looking for or why he thought uh, he needed to, uh, you know, actually inspect the chopper of the Prime Minister while the SPG was present? Well, nothing nothing as of now. The Election Commission has clearly said that uh, the action of Mohammed Mohsin clearly uh, uh, somewhere uh, tried to, uh, he, he was uh, doing something which was not acted in conformity with the ECI instruction. And that is why uh, the commission felt that what Mr. Uh, Mohsin did was not the correct thing to do. And that is why he has been placed in the suspension. All right. Uh, quick recap of that breaking news. Thank you, Aishman. The Election Commission has suspended General Observer Mohammed Mohsin, who allegedly attempted to inspect Prime Minister Narendra Modi's chopper at Sambalpur. Mohsin is a Karnataka Kada IAS officer who's been suspended for dereliction of duty until further orders. That's a wrap here on the urban debate. We're going to take a quick break, but stay with Mirana for more news and updates. Thanks for watching. Good night.